fight, fight, or flee, no matter which it be. When you get that catecholamine call, you've got the amino acid tyrosine to thank for it all. So tyrosine is an amino acid, and we often think about amino acids as serving as protein letters, and tyrosine can, but it can also do way more. It can serve as a precursor for making catecholamines, including dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these play important signaling molecules roles throughout our body by acting as hormones, so a signal that gets secreted into your bloodstream, as well as neurotransmitters, so a signal that kind of gets sent from a nerve cell to a neighboring cell, and we'll talk more about these differences. As that wasn't enough, tyrosine can also serve as a precursor for making thyroid hormones as well as melanin. And tyrosine itself comes from phenylalanine, which is the amino acid that we looked at yesterday. You can see that tyrosine, as we'll talk about, it has this extra OH group, which is going to make it more polar. It's going to make it hang out better with water. When we make those further modifications to it um, through this catecholamine synthesis pathway, say, then we're going to make it even better hang out with water, so more water soluble, make it a better hormone, make it adapted so that it can travel through the bloodstream and then bind to various adrenergic receptors on cells. And so let's talk about how this pathway works to make all these different things from tyrosine, other things about tyrosine, um, and let's go. So we're going to look at a lot of different things that we can make from tyrosine, as well as some other properties of tyrosine, such as its ability to absorb UV light. Um, but let's start with some of the things that we can make, and we'll start with the really exciting things. Let's talk about catecholamines. Um, and so fight, flight, flee, all of that good, goody stuff, um, the sympathetic nervous system. For this, we have tyrosine to thank. Um, this is where we're going to get our dopamine and our noradrenaline and our adrenaline, and we'll look at how we're going to do that, um, the biosynthetic pathways that actually take place. And importantly, these are only going to be able to take place in pl specific places in your body, um, and therefore you're going to control where the signals get sent from, and then these different cells will have different receptors and if the cells have the receptor and based on what type of cell it is and what type of receptor it is, um, when they get that message, when they get that chemical message coming from one of these catecholamines, then they're able to do things like make your blood, but like direct your blood, to like constrict certain vessels, like in your toes and stuff, and then like send your blood, like vasodilate. So open up blood vessels to get blood to like your heart um, and, um, various other things like making it so that your cells stop making um, stop making glycogen so they stop like building up like storage sugar and instead start like breaking stuff down so you have more energy in order to go fight fight or flee um, and so it's much more complicated than that um, but I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not going to try to get into that um, but what I will get into is how we actually make these compounds but first, we need to talk about what, before we get too confused about names, adrenaline and epinephrine is the same thing, and noradrenaline and norepinephrine is the same thing. But these are different from one another. And so whether you call it like adrenaline or epinephrine, this depends on like where you live. So in Europe, they tend to use adrenaline, whereas in the US, they tend to use epinephrine. Although I've always used adrenaline more than epinephrine. Um, but epinephrine, you can remember like an EpiPen if you have an allergic reaction, um, because it's going to be helping um, like dilate those blood vessels, dilate the airways, all that stuff so that you're able to recover if you have like anaphylactic shock and stuff. But again, not a medical doctor. I'm not going to try to get too much into what these various um, molecules do, especially because what they do is going to depend on the cell type that's receiving the signal and what type of receptor it has. Um, but noradrenaline and adrenaline, basically, they differ from one another, and adrenaline has this methyl group, the CH3 group, and later we're going to look at the enzymes of the reaction helper that actually does this conversion. It's this enzyme called phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, or PNMT. And we'll see that only some cells are actually actually have that. And so only some cells are actually going to make adrenaline from noradrenaline. And the cells that have it, the cells that are going to make this adrenaline are um, mostly in the adrenal medulla. Um, and so adrenal, adrenaline, 
wait, what are we talking about? We're talking about the same type of thing. Yep, that's where the name comes from. And this name actually comes from being near the kidney. So add near renal kidney. And in fact, if we look at epinephrine, well, that means above the kidney. And so all of this is talking about how we're getting this, um, we're getting this compound from mainly this, this adrenal medulla. There's also a little bit made in the brain. Um, but this adrenaline is going to be primarily, primarily made in the adrenal medulla. It's going to be made um, based on signals from the adrenal cortex. And so this is the part like the outside of the glands, kind of like a, if you think about like an or like a fruit, this would be like the rind, the cortex, and then inside like the, the fleshy stuff, that would be the medulla. And so in the medulla is where you're going to get this conversion from the adrenaline to the noradrenaline. Um, but in, in other cells, however, you can still have this adrenaline made or this noradrenaline made. And so your brain is actually making a lot of nor noradrenaline as is your, just like your nervous system in general. And it's using that, neuroadre that noradrenaline primarily as a neurotransmitter. Whereas when we talk about the um, adrenaline, we're going to be using that mostly as a hormone, but both can serve both roles. Um, and so what do I mean by a neurotransmitter versus a hormone? Basically, both of these are types of chemical messengers that your cells can use to signal to other cells. In the case of a neurotransmitter, you're doing like a short range signaling from a neuron, so from a nervous system cell, so from like a nerve cell, to either another nerve cell or to like a muscle cell or something like that. But you're sending it over just like this tiny little distance, so the end of the nerve cell it's going to like send this, release this message and then the cells like right above like next to it is going to take it in um and so you have this like short range motion and this is good if you want to like raise your eyebrow or something which i can't really do um but you want to send like a specific message to a specific place but if you want to send a wider message like hey there's a bear like all this stuff in my body i need to go like activate it to do stuff well, then you need um, something that's going to be broader acting. And so this is where hormones come in. Now, a hormone, it gets secreted by a gland. So basically, a gland is something that's going to secrete hormones. So it's going to let release these hormones from itself into the bloodstream. And once it's in the bloodstream, now it can travel throughout the body. And so it's kind of like sending out a broadcast message. But just like how there's all sorts of like, cried going on on the radio that you're not listening to because you're not tuned into that station well not all the cells are tuned into that station not all the cells have the receptors for various hormones and even if um they do they have different receptors and so they could respond differently to think of like maybe i don't know like how you react to something someone says on the radio it'll be different than how someone else reacts your cells will have different types of receptors for these different hormones, so they can do different things. And because these cells are different, then they can do different things. And then not all the cells are actually going to have those receptors in the first place. Um, so basically, you get these differential responses in different cells um, throughout your body. And so there's lots of different hormones, and there's lots of different neurotransmitters. Um, but the ones that we make from, from tyrosine, include these catecholamines and we'll also talk about like the thyroid hormones that you can get from tyrosine but we're going to start with these catecholamines so we're talking about dopamine L um, noradrenaline adrenaline um and so noradrenaline this is going to and as well as so dopamine that's going to be a precursor to make noradrenaline and there's some cells in your body that are just in your brain that just use the dopamine for like reward signaling things in the secretion of your brain called the substantia nigra um but most of them is is going to be converted into noradrenaline and this noradrenaline is going to actually serve as the main neurotransmitter um, in the sympathetic nerves in your cardiovascular system. So when we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, um, there's like a sympathetic nervous system and there's a parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic is like your fight or flight. Um, and then the parasympathetic is like your rest and digest. But you don't want to always be resting and like if your heart was always resting you'd be dead and so you need to have like your pair you need to have sympathetic activity going on like all the time to keep yourself like actually not 
to keep your heart working and to keep all of that stuff going. And so this noradrenaline is actually used as a neurotransmitter. So remember a neurotransmitter is going from a nerve to another nerve or to another mu to a muscle cell or some sort of responding cell in that short distance. And so noradrenaline is used in this, um, it, in this sense the, for this purpose. Um, and so you get a lot of noradrenaline um, function that way um, as a neurotransmitter. Now, there's some regions of your brain in like your brain stun that can make some adrenaline from noradrenaline, but most of the conversion that we'll see is actually going to happen in that adrenal medulla, as we, as I mentioned before. And when you have it here, now it's happening in this gland. Remember, gland, that's signifying a hormone, a hormone, something that gets secreted into the bloodstream. And so this is going to get secreted into the bloodstream and be able to travel throughout your body. Um, and then different cells can respond to it. Um, and then remember, they're going to respond in different ways, depending on what types of receptors that they have. And so there's different types of like adrenergic receptors. Um, and these receptors, um, they bind to this signal. So they bind to this um, noradrenaline or to the adrenaline um, on, from, on the outside. And then what happens is they're going to undergo like a change inside. So you have these receptors that span the whole membrane. When something happens on the outside, so when that binds, we can call this, um, we would say that adrenaline would be like the ligand, so the binding partner um, for this re receptor. Um, these receptors, these adren adrenergic receptors are like GC GPCR um, re receptors. Um, G couple protein coupled receptors. So basically what happens is that inside when something binds out here, you get this change in here where like a GDP is exchanged for GTP and this little G protein. Um, but basically end result, you get a signaling cascade when something binds. And so when that adrenaline binds, you're going to get a signaling cascade that leads to all those fancy dancy effects. Um, and so that's and then remember, different cells are going to have different types of receptors. And so these um, noradrenaline and adrenaline, they'll have like different receptors um, and different flavors of receptors and various things like that. And again, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm not going to go into all of this stuff, but I will go into the biochemistry of how they're made and why they're made the way that they're made um, type of thing. And so if you look at how they're made, you're going to see that there's a lot, each of these arrows this is a reaction that's going to be catalyzed by a different enzyme. And so an enzyme is a reaction speeder upper. Um, they help reactions happen by doing things like holding things in the right place, um, in the right orientation, making it so that they're more reactive and they'll, they'll want to react. Um, and so if say you wanted to make tyrosine from phenylalanine, you can't just get oxygen to like bump into phenylalanine and voila, it makes a tyrosine. Instead, you need an enzyme to help make it happen. So to help bring the oxygen near the phenylalanine in the correct position, all of this various things. Additionally, this is also going to need the help of a cofactor. And so a cofactor is like a little helper molecule that enzymes can use. And different enzymes use different cofactors. A lot of them are like vitamin derived and that sort of thing. In the case of phenylalanine hydroxylase, it's going to use this molecule called THB or tetrahydrobiopterin as is the tyrosine hydroxylase, which is going to add the second oxygen. But first, this first oxygen. Um, and so basically, this first oxygen is going to get added here to this like para position. Um, when it's like across from this carbon, we call it para. Um, and if it was like right next to it, we would call it ortho. Um, and then if it was like two away, we call it meta. But this is the para position. Um, and basically what happens is you're this hydroxyl, you're adding an oxygen and a hydroxyl group, so an OH group. And this is going to have the effect of helping make this, make this polar and making it more water soluble. And so if we want something that's going to travel through our bloodstream, we're going to want something that, need, that hangs out well with water because, well, our bloodstream is like mainly water, right? Um, and so if we have something that is hydrophobic, if it's water avoided, that's not going to be a very good hormone, is it? And so if we look at phenylalanine, we can see it's really hydrophobic. Um, and so this is typically, this is why we find it typically in like the center of proteins and things where it's hidden away from the water. 
And why it's hydrophobic is because these carbons and these hydrogens, basically they share electrons really fairly. Um, and this makes it so that there's no like charged or partial charge regions that the water can hang out with. Um, and so when you have hydrophobic things, they tend to be avoided by the water. Um, and that's why we find them like clumped together in the center of proteins, kind of like hiding away from that water. Um, but in the case of tyrosine, well, now we have this oxygen. And oxygen is what we call electronegative. It's basically going to pull away some of that electrons. And those electrons are negatively charged. So this is going to give you a separation of charge. And so you have a little bit of polarity. You still have a lot of nonpolar character. So it's still hydrophobic, um, but it's not as hydrophobic. Um, and I should mention too that there's also like this backbone is going to help it be soluble too. It's not just like it's attached in a protein um, where this was the only part sticking out. Um, but anyway, so when you add that hydroxyl group, well, now you're increasing the solubility. Um, so making tyrosine less hydrophobic, but still hydrophobic. Still want to be like a great hormone or that sort of thing. But now we can do, we can modify it further. Let's add a second OH. So we can add a second OH um, this time with the help of tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, I'll note too that there's another pathway we can use um, when, we, um, when we're talking about melanin synthesis. Um, synthesis, um, we're gonna use like um, tyrosinase. We're gonna go through a different pathway. But when we're making catecholamines, you use this tyrosine hydroxylase. And when you add the second oxygen, well, this makes this a catecholamine. So this, the first oxygen made it tyrosine, the second oxygen makes it a catecholamine. It gets this name because when you have a benzene ring with two oxygens, um, so this is a benzene ring when you have the six-membered ring with this thing called aromaticity, which we'll talk about later, and I talked about a lot more about on my post on phenylalanine, but basically you have electrons shared throughout the ring, not just between the, the neighboring molecules. So it's kind of like a special kind of bond that can be shared by more than just the neighboring molecules. And so when you have a benzene with those two oxygens, you call it a catecholamine, um, a catechol. And then you have this amine group um, and from the amino acid, this is going to make it a catecholamine. So this is a L-dopa is a catecholamine. What about the L? Where's that L come from? I remember I was always confused about this. I'm like, what's, what's L-dopa? Um, well, basically, the L just refers to the stereochemistry. So stereochemistry refers to like which direction things are oriented in space. And so if you think about like having your right and your left hand, they look um, they look like mirror images, but they're not. Um, they're not superimposable. There are mirror images, but they're not superimposable. They're not the same if you were to like flip them over. And this happens, um, this is what we call enantiomers, and they're a special kind of stereoisomer. Um, and you can get these on an amino acid because you can have the side chain so that unique part sticking off the backbone, it can kind of be sticking forward or backwards. And in the case of like all our amino acids in our body, they're all in the L form, which is like forward, backward, whatever, however you want to call it. Um, but they're in this one form, um, this one kind of like hand. And so since you're starting with L-tyrosine, you're going to get L-dopa. Um, and so that's where the L in this L-dopa comes in. And so this L-dopa, um, it now is a catecholamine because we have those two oxygens on that benzene ring. Um, and now we can modify it further um, and it can get modified further to make dopamine. And this step is going to be done by dopa decarboxylase or DDC. Um, and it also decarboxylates other aromatic amino acids. So another name for it is aromatic amino acid decarboxylase or AABC. What it's going to do is, well, it's going to decarboxylate. Um, so this carboxyl group. Um, so we're going to remove that. So we had an amino group which um, and then a carboxyl group because this started from an amino acid. And those are the two groups that are going to make it an amino acid because this is also like a carboxylic acid group. Um, and so if you remove that carboxyl group, um, now you still have a catecholamine because you still have those two oxygens on that benzene ring and you still have that amine group. Um, but now you don't have that carboxylic acid group.
And this removal is going to be done with the help of dopa decarboxylase. And it's going to use a different cofactor. This one's going to use pyridoxal phosphate, which is a vitamin D6 derivative. Um, and so it's going to remove that to give you dopamine. Now, there are some cells in your brain, um, and like the substantia nigra, that are going to stop here. Um, but most of the other cells are going to get, um, so that's in like your midbrain. Um, and they use the dopamine as a neurotransmitter as it is, and it plays important roles in reward responses. But most of the cells are going to take things further, and they're going to take things to noradrenaline. Um, and they're going to do so by using dopamine beta hydroxylase. So if we look at dopamine versus noradrenaline, what are we doing? We're adding a third oxygen, but this case, we're not adding it on the ring. We're adding it in the slinker region. Um, and this enzyme is going to use a different cofactor. It's going to use ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. So you can see we have a lot of vitamins helping us out here. Um, and so this is going to add this oxygen group. Um, and so this is noradrenaline. And if your cells don't have this PNMT, or even if they do potentially, um, they're just going to stop and you can use noradrenaline as is. But you can also take things a step further and go to make adrenaline. And remember the difference between noradrenaline and adrenaline is the addition of this methyl or CH3 group. And where's it coming from? It's coming from SAM. Um, SAM I am. No, okay, s adenosyl methionine. Um, and so this is a common cofactor that we use in order to transfer methyl groups, so to transfer CH3 groups from one thing to another. Um, and this methyl group actually comes originally from methionine. And so when we talk about methionine, we'll see how methionine can be used um, in order to help methylate things. And there's a lot of different functions of methylation in terms of things like regulation, DNA and stuff like that, in addition to helping just like build up molecules, um, it can also regulate the molecules. Um, but in this case, we have this um, SAM being used by phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, that enzyme I told you about before, PNMT, um, and it's going to transfer that methyl group from, from methionine onto noradrenaline, and it's going to do so on this amine group, and this is going to give you adrenaline. And voila, you've got adrenaline. But remember, this enzyme is only found in specific places, most particularly in your adrenal medulla, so that inside the like pulpy part of, of that adrenal gland, adrenal ad, ad near the kidneys, um, so that gland on top of your kidneys. And voila, that is how you get this um, noradrenaline, and you get to adrenaline um through this pathway and of course though if you you don't want that signal to just be like hanging around forever right it's when you don't need it um you don't want to just like always be in a flight or fight response like once you figure out oh that wasn't actually a bear that was just my friend and he needs to like go shave well then you want to like turn off the signal right and so these catecholamines can get broken down, and to break them down requires catecholamine O-methyltransferase, COMT, and monoamine oxidase, or MAO. And if MAO sounds familiar, it's likely because MAO inhibitors are sometimes used as antidepressants. Um, but that is the basics of the catecholamine synthesis. And so remember, you're going from phenylalanine to tyrosine, or if you start with tyrosine, you start with tyrosine. Take that to L-DOPA. Um, and this step is going to make it a catecholamine. So this is the first of the catecholamines in the pathway because we have those two oxygens on the benzene, that's a catechol, and we have this amino group. So we get a catecholamine um, that can then be taken decarboxylated. So remove that carboxyl group that gives you dopamine. Dopamine can then be um, add another oxygen group onto it to get noradrenaline. And then add a methyl group onto that to get adrenaline. Um, and these can act as hormones as well as neurotransmitters. Um, okay, that's not all you can make with tyrosine, though. And that's not even all that you can make with L-DOPA. So if you start with tyrosine, before we looked at how you could use this tyrosine hydroxylase to make L-DOPA from it. But there's another enzyme that can do this, um, and this enzyme tyrosinase. Um, so in uh, the reach in the substantia nigra of your brain, 
This gets its name because it has a dark blue black color and it has that black, dark blue black color because it makes the pigment um, melanin. And so melanin is made in this um, in this region of the brain and it's made from L-dopa, which is made from tyrosine, but you get to that L-dopa using a different enzyme, you use tyrosinase. Um, and so that because tyrosine is important for making melanin, there are various forms of albinism um, that are actually caused by mutations in tyrosinase or other enzymes in this pathway that give you a problem breaking down tyrosine to make melanin. Um, you can also have problems if you have problems um, with tyrosine uh, metabolism because tyrosine is used in order to make thyroid hormones. And so these are important for helping regulate growth and things. Um, you have this like monoiodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine as well as um, this like weird T3 and T4. Um, basically what happens is that you get iodines added onto tyrosine and then those kind of link up to give you these thyroid hormones. And what's really weird is it's like, this is probably, I don't know if there are other places, but iodine is not very common in your body, but you need it. And like, that's why we have like iodinized salt and stuff. Um, and so it's being used to hook up with tyrosine to make these thyroid hormones. So what else can we say about um, tyrosine's metabolism? So metabolism, making and breaking of molecules. When we talk about catabolism, breaking down things, um, how do we break down tyrosine? Uh, before we are just kind of like modifying it, but how do we actually break it down? Um, it turns out that we can break it down. It's going to go through the same pathway we talked about in the case of phenylalanine yesterday, because, well, phenylalanine gets broken down into tyrosine, which then gets broken down this way. And when it gets broken down, um, you end up with components that are both glucogenic and ketogenic. Um, so you end up with components. Um, if we look here, you're getting fumarate, which is going to be glucogenic. You can use it to make glucose. And you're getting, um, where do we go? We're getting um, acetylacetyl-CoA, um, which can be used to make ketone bodies. And so we call it ketogenic. And I talk much more about this in other posts. Um, especially the leucine post, but if you make, if you break something down to get acetyl-CoA or acetyl-acetyl-CoA, we call that ketogenic. And if you break it down to make a component of this tricarboxylic acid cycle, this Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, well, then we call it glucogenic because oxaloacetate from that pathway can be used to make glucose or blood sugar. And so tyrosine is going to be both glucogenic and ketogenic. And if you have problems with the breakdown of tyrosine, um, you there are various problems that we talked about. Um, and also there are various causes of these problems. And so we talked, I have a whole post on like PKU, so phenyl ketonuria, which is a disorder that's caused by problems converting um, phenylalanine to tyrosine. But you can also have problems with breaking down tyrosine we call this like tyrosinemias. Um, and so there's various things that can happen depending on where in the pathway, um, where in the pathway you have that mutation and we give those different names as well. So that was ba the basics of tyrosine metabolism. Um, but there's a lot of other things about tyrosine and I'm just gonna mention a few. One is that tyrosine can get phosphorylated. And so it offers an opportunity for post-translational modification. So when proteins are made, we call that process translation when those different amino acids are linked together to form a protein. And they're linked together in like their normal form. And so tyrosine's linked like this, serine, threonine, these are all just like in their normal form. But what can happen is that some of these, especially these tyrosine, serine, and threonine, these give you the opportunity to add a post-translational modification. So after the protein, after this amino acid has been incorporated into the protein, it can then get modified. Um, it can get modified by kinases, the enzymes that are going to add a phosphate group. So they add this bulky negatively charged group that's going to kind of um, impact how the impact how the protein is going to full to like function potentially it can offer a new binding site it can cause the protein to kind of change shape a little so it'll go undergo a conformational change 
because now you've introduced this big bulky group after you've already like pulled it up. Now you have this negatively charged bulky thing. You got to kind of shift around to accommodate it. And so when you, this is a common way that you can send signals with proteins. And so for example, tyrosine not only does it make those hormones that can act as ligands for receptors, but it can actually be a key component of the receptors themselves can be tyrosine phosphorylation. And in fact, we have receptor tyrosine kinases um, that basically these are receptors that bind to various, um, various messengers, such as like growth hormones. And what happens is inside, they phosphorylate one another in order to send off a signaling cascade. And these phosphorylations are happening on tyrosine. And so receptor tyrosine kinases are really important. Um, and because they often are involved with growth signaling and things like this, mutations in them that cause them to be like constitutively active. So make it that they're like active all the time. They don't need a ligand or they're like hyperactive. They're more active than usual. These are often um, associated with various cancers. Um, but the tyrosine phosphorylation itself um, plays a key role in helping regulate um, regulate various things. Um, tyrosine is also um, aromatic, um, and so so is phenylalanine and tryptophan. And what this means is basically, in addition, all these atoms are linked. These carbons and these hydrogens and these oxygens, these are all linked together by sharing pairs of electrons. Much more about them in another post. Um, but basically, those single bonds is where you share a single pair, and a double bond is where you share two pairs. Um, what happens in this thing called um, resonance or electron delocalization is that you have not quite enough for double bonds for all of these atoms, um, but not but more than single bonds. So they spend an electron to um, form a single bond, and then they have like extras, and they kind of donate them into this like delocalized delocalized bond. Um, and in the case of an aromatic um, molecule, this is happening in a ring. And so you get these electrons shared in kind of like this donut shape above and below the ring. Um, and because in order to have like the donut be a donut, you can't be rotating around. And so this needs to be planar. So this is going to be flat. So if you have something aromatic, it's going to be flat. Um, and another consequence is it also absorbs UV light. This makes it really useful for tracking proteins in the lab, say, when you're purifying them. And so we'll talk more about this when we talk about tryptophan, which is the main absorber of UV light when we um when we come when it comes to proteins. Um, final notes: so tyrosine gets its name from tyros, which is Greek for cheese. Um, it was discovered by the German chemist Eustace von von Liebig in 1846 from casein, casein, which is a protein in milk and cheese, hence cheese. Um, and then a couple years later, Warren De La Rue found it in an insect, and then Erlen um, Emil Emil Erlenmeyer, that glass guy, you know those glasses that go. Um, he found it. Um, and synthesized he and Flint synthesized it, and so I'll post a link to more on the history. So that's the basics of tyrosine. So we get it from phenylalanine, and we can make things from it. We can make catecholamines, things like our dopamine, our noradrenaline, our adrenaline, thyroid hormones, as well as melanin. Um, so like skin pigments, all of these things come from tyrosine. Um, and so it's one of the coolest amino acids you've ever seen, maybe. <laughs>